Welcome. Welcome to another outstanding City Club Forum. Welcome. My name is Susan Kelly, President of the Club. Today we get an up-to-the-minute report on Portland's business climate. Our speaker is John Russell, Chairman of the Portland Development Commission and President of the Russell Development Company. Next Friday there will be no program. Have a safe and happy Thanksgiving. Friday, December 6th, join us back here at the Multnomah Athletic Club for a program featuring David Espa, Executive Director of the Audubon Society of Portland, who will talk about the organization's 100 years of conservation. Please note that our annual fundraising campaign is underway. And though we are over the halfway mark, we've been hovering there now for three weeks, as you may have noticed, we still need to make it all the way to the top. Our goal is $100,000. There's pledge forms on your tables, whether you're a member or not. Please, please consider supporting our extensive programs with a contribution. Anyone interested in obtaining a video or audio tape of this or other city club programs, do so by calling our office. The videotape is 20 and the audio is 10, and Suzanne will help you. Our board host, seated at the head table, is Heather Kometz, member of the Board of Governors and attorney with the Hannah Strader Law Firm. She will have the privilege of asking the first question of our speaker. Following Heather's question, we'll open the program to questions from City Club members in the audience. Please line up behind the microphone even before Heather is finished so we have time to ask as many questions as possible. Please identify yourself as a member of the City Club and ask your question in 30 seconds or less. Broadcast of City Club programs this quarter is made possible in part by corporate underwriting from Pacific Care, Pope and Talbot, and Warhauser Company Foundation. We're very grateful for their support. The Portland Development Commission was formed in 1958 by a vote of the citizens of Portland. Their mission statement is to assist business and industry in creating jobs and investing investment that provide a full range of employment opportunities and economic benefits to all residents. And in a year ago, the mayor challenged the Portland Development Commission to update their strategy since nothing has changed since 1994 in that strategy with a new five-year plan. Um, John Russell will speak today on that update. John was born in Seattle, uh, but made it here to the Portland area to attend Lake Oswego High School. From there, he went to the Webb Institute of Naval Architecture, which is on Long Island, he said. And he said, nobody's ever heard of it. Um, <laughs> and from, Harvard, from there, he went to Harvard Graduate School uh, in Business Administration. 25 years ago, after understudying with uh, Melvin Mark, and Pete and his lovely wife were here today, uh, he went on to form his own development company, John Russell Development. He has been very successful as a businessman, a developer, and um, uh, entrepreneur here in Portland. He currently serves on numerous boards and commissions, chairman of the PDC, the Oregon Trans and he's on the Oregon Transportation Commission, and the Portland Business Alliance, and the, mayor, the Mayor's Business Roundtable, and the Mayor is here too. Welcome, Vera Katz. He has many, many past boards, and I won't list them all, but it's interesting to note that some of them are devoted to his passion of the built environment in the city of Portland and its transportation, um, historical commission, Portland uh, planning commission, and others serving the broader common good, Thousand Friends of Oregon, YMCA, Columbia Willamette, and United Way. So I am very, very happy to present to you John Russell. Thank you, Susan. Remember when economist jokes were all the rage? At the height of that uh, fad years ago, I heard a prominent economist say that there was only one joke he'd heard among the thousands that got under his skin. And that is the definition of an economist is when told that some, something works in practice, doesn't believe it until he's actually shown that it can work in theory as well. <laughs> If you hear more laughter from two tables in the center here, <laughs> it's because there's a support group of our longtime uh, book group co-founded by my wife, Mary Fellows, and Tuck Wilson. One of the common threads, actually, of that book group is that most of us are longtime uh, City Club members. 
I'd like to, to uh, introduce two people of the other people at the table. Actually, one needs no introduction, and that's Mayor Vera Katz. Don Mazziotti is the executive director of the Portland Development Commission. Don's resume is perfectly matched to his job. Among many other things, Don has been the planning director for the city of Portland, secretary of commerce for the state of Pennsylvania, and CEO of a real estate consulting company. And like all of us on the commission, uh, we straddle the public and private sector. An informal rule, I guess, is that members of the commission love the private sector, love the uh, public sector, and yet realize the limitations of both. So back to econ <coughs> excuse me, economists. Local and national economists were secretly fascinated when in the year 2000, the economic equivalent of a perfect storm hit Portland. We went in remarkably short order from being the top of the heap, measured in low unemployment and high growth rates, to ranking 50th out of 50 in unemployment. What were the elements of this perfect storm? One was a cyclical downturn in transportation manufacturing, both in trucks and rail cars. Secondly, a regional energy crisis. Third, a national recession. Fourth, a stock market collapse. And fifth, a global downturn in the high technology industry, which has become critical to our region in the last 30 years. And if those factors weren't enough, 2000, September 11th, 2001 piled on more economic destruction. This is an audience that I don't need to remind uh, of that the healthy economy is the underpinning, really, for our other aspirations. Without a he healthy economic base, living wage employment opportunities will diminish, demands on the welfare and other employment systems will grow, housing costs and home ownership will be out of reach of more residents, Revenues will shrink that our city and state depend on to support our educational system, transportation network, and all of the cultural and environmental, and environmental amenities of the quality of life we hold so dear. Oddly enough, the recession that hit uh, Oregon was particularly painful in the Portland area. Our region saw its unemployment rate exceed that of the rest of the state for the first time in recent memory. As a result, never has there been a better time to begin to, clear, to clearly identify our key challenges for economic recovery and to begin to develop strategies to address those challenges. So a year ago last September, Mayor Katz outlined in a speech attended by some 300 people her plan for addressing the, these issues. Three weeks ago, to that same audience, uh, of frankly, uh, actually a frankly skeptical audience, of business people, she announced the results. At the end of her speech, she received such warm and long applause that she actually had to ask that it be to die down in order to answer questions. As the chair of the private sector folks that she assembled for that year-long effort, I'd like to tell you today what we concluded and what we're doing to put the plan into action. The mayor assembled some 200 business people to help her develop the strategy. The effort was staffed by the Portland Development Commission, whose, ex whose executive director, Don Mazziotti, has already been introduced, and whose economic development director, Marty Harris, had the tenacity to see it through in record time. You might be interested to learn that the group included several folks from outside the Portland, uh, uh, outside Portland. The ex-Intel uh, Oregon site manager, for example, the assistant manager, city manager of Hillsborough, a prominent business executive from Gresham and others. Clearly, all communities in this region have a stake in the success of the other communities. There were 12 advisory panels formed to provide industry-specific input to the strategy. These panels included high technology, bioscience, metals, transportation equipment, distribution and logistics, sustainable industries, creative services, professional and business services, tourism, destination, destination retail, workforce, and finance. We then used consultants to, to research key economic drivers. What are the factors for business location decisions? And how does Portland measure up in terms of those factors against 10 other regions in the nation? 
here's what we found, found out. It, as advantages, Portland has good highway and transit systems, a skilled workforce, a solid technology base, a strong central city, several robust industry clusters, and plentiful recreational and cultural opportunities for which we are justifiably proud. Our disadvantages as a region include a location far from major markets, a relatively small airport, declining marine port competitiveness, higher income tax and sewer costs, a lack of uh, large research universities and as a consequence, a low patent rate and little research and development activity. And as a region, we lack large vacant tracts of industrial and commercial land, particularly in the city of Portland. Parenthetically, uh, we've had large industrial tracts, uh, vacant industrial tracts close to the center of our city during all of my adult life, first on Swan Island and then on Rivergate, but we're clearly near the end of that era. We also looked at how the city of Portland stacks up with the other jurisdictions in the region, because if we're going to function effectively as a region, Portland has to hold up its end of the bargain. As assets, now this is measured against other cities in the region, Portland has moderate development fees, we have a wide range of housing types, we have extensive cultural and economic resources. On the downside, Portland relative to the rest of the region, as I've mentioned, has a short supply of buildable industrial land. We have a very difficult construct a construction review and permitting process, which has given us, rightly or wrongly, a reputation as a difficult place in which to do business. We have higher costs for water and sewer. We have higher taxes for businesses. We have schools that are deficient relative to the rest of the region and, like other big cities, relatively higher crime rates and greater congestion. It's important to note that before the Blue Ribbon Committee took the input from all these different panels, from the consultants and from the staff, we established several guiding principles. One of the most critical was that since 80% of our job growth comes from existing businesses, we really have to pay attention to them. And while everyone realizes the importance of recruiting new companies, if you're doing what's good for the companies that are already here, generally you're doing the very things that will attract others. Secondly, when we look at the targets for recruiting, we must build on our strengths, our existing clusters. Thirdly, we need to recognize that quality of life and economic development are not antithetical. There's been a tendency in the past to assume that if we're doing something that's helpful to business, we must be doing somehow doing something that's harmful to the environment. In our newly mobile society, in fact, quality of life is near the very top of the list of assets for recruiters. Fourth, since almost 40% of the current city of Portland revenues come directly from business fees and taxes, we need strong, healthy businesses to provide the jobs and the revenues we need to support the services that ultimately support our quality of life. Lastly, our committee uh, developed the four, four principles for implementation. Dubbed the four Fs, they are set a few priorities, focus on them, finish them first, and then follow up to see what works, and then go on to pick a few more. So what are the strategy's recommendations? First, in the category of land and buildings, we must move to develop our fallow industrial land. Many urban properties are either um, underutilized or vacant because of contamination, aging infrastructure, or out-of-date regulatory prohibitions. Also in that category, a controversial recommendation has been qualified support for small urban growth boundary expansions. I say qualified because the expansion that was supported is measured in the hundreds of acres, not the thousands that were requested. The quid pro quo has been both a prohibition of other uses, such as big box retail or housing subdivisions, um, and a requirement that even industrial users wouldn't subdivide uh, the space into smaller industrial lots. Mayor Katz is an unheralded student of land use laws, and she came to this conclusion reluctantly, but in the end enthusiastically. 
Second, in the category of infrastructure, expanding international air service abroad, both passenger and cargo, is a huge priority for which the port is taking the lead and already, as we know, achieving success. An additional priority is truck mobility. In most cases, but not all, what helps auto relieve automobile congestion also helps relieve truck congestion. But there are exceptions. As an example, the City of Portland and the Port of Portland lobbied ODOT successfully to help fund a solution to a massive airport truck delivery bottleneck near the intersection of Columbia Boulevard, 82nd Avenue, and the main UP rail line. Not a place that cars frequent for good reason. A vitally important but unseen and poorly, under, poor, poorly understood part of our transportation infrastructure is our freight rail system. Our rail yards have hardly changed in decades. The port uh, has taken the lead to plan revisions totaling some $130 million, which seems expensive until you compare it to the $2 billion that Long Beach has recently invested for the same category. The third and perhaps the most important category uh, falls under the general climate of uh, business climate, category business climate. Businesses contemplating construction require, above all else, certainty. Our fees for permitting processes here in Portland are not excessively high. The direct cost is not the issue. The issue is the time required and the predictability of the process. Significantly, we also recommended that the city and the county replace their current business income taxes with alternative business taxes that don't provide incentives to moving out of the city. Frankly, a business income tax is the worst tax from an economic development perspective because in our mobile economy, many businesses can relocate out of the city, conduct their businesses undiminished, and avoid paying the tax. My personal opinion is that we need to move toward taxing business property rather than business income. Additionally, we recommended that we must attract venture capital to the area. Uh, like all of us, uh, venture capitalists like what's called line of sight uh, management. They invest in businesses that are close to them. In that spirit, we need to, need to assist our local institutions, uh, such as OHSU and PSU, with technology transfer, which is when R&D becomes commercial, to ensure that when that technology transfer takes place, it takes place to a company that's located here, that has the support to stay here. In the area of workforce preparedness and education, the city needs to lend a strong voice to improving our K through 16 educational system with a special emphasis on science and engineering. We also need to work with the community college system to make sure that their curriculum and training programs are responsive to employer needs. We need to support housing development throughout the city to provide for our workforce. And lastly, we need to market ourselves both nationally and internationally using a coordinated regional approach. Frankly, this economic development strategy process reminds me of the tumultuous time that many of us may remember of the downtown plan of the early 1970s. The process of devising the plan was so widespread, it involved so many people, that by the time the council got around to adopting the plan, many of the important projects were already done or were underway. The very process of formulating the plan had validated the ideas, so why wait? So, so too with this plan. For example, as I noted earlier, one of the burrs under the saddle uh, for our Blue Ribbon Committee was the permit process. Not the cost of the permits, but the time and the attitude. And even though I chaired the group and we had only half a dozen meetings of several hours apiece, despite my efforts to the contrary, one entire meeting was devoted to that topic. Well, the mayor's office was present for that discussion and they acted. The mayor has signed her chief of staff, Sam Adams, to honcho the effort. Adams uh, is the type of person you'd want to organize the Normandy invasion. <laughs> Among other actions, he emailed seemingly everyone in the city and asked for a top 10 list of regulations uh, that should be eliminated. I'm happy to say that on October 16th, a week before the mayor presented her speech, the council unanimously approved a resolution to commence action to eliminate the now top 15. 
Another example of the implementation moving forward on a fast pace is the work leading up to the announcement of the Lufthansa nonstop flight to Frankfurt uh, and the Air China cargo flight to Beijing and Shanghai. As many of you know, what swung the Lufthansa deal was an innovative travel bank of commitments uh, for travel from a long list of companies here. Our strategy called for this action, but more importantly, many of the people who mobilized for this effort as part of the strategy are the folks who put, uh, took part in the formulation of the strategy. They were already accustomed to working together. In any case, these are just two examples. No one was waiting for the mayor's speech, or, or for this speech, for that matter. The second part of the implementation is the way that it will inform the city budget. The mayor has made a commitment that funding for these strategies will part, be a part of a recommended budget. It's a clear sign that economic development is near the top of Portland's priority list. Third, as I mentioned, a very energetic and capable group of private individuals will be overseeing the long-term implementation of the strategy, the Mayor's Business Roundtable. The Mayor announced that the new chair of the roundtable is Mark Dodson, the CEO of Northwest Natural, uh, a familiar player in both the public and the private spheres. The final recommendation is that the Portland Development Commission redouble its efforts. We are, by and large, that magical interface between the public sector of the city and its private sector. Our job is to carefully leverage public sector money to cause the private sector to invest where it wouldn't without the public commitment. Uh, I've said that our motto ought to be, we're not the fire, we're the spark. In our 10 urban renewal areas where the city council has decided that major investments are needed, we need to we, we work to promote the goals of the strategy. Uh, business investment for retail office and industrial uses, affordable housing and parks and rec park and recreational uses. In our 45-year history, PDC has been responsible for such landmark developments as Pioneer Square, Pioneer Place, the entire South Auditorium area, the entire river and Pearl Districts, River Place, the East Bank Esplanade, the Classical Chinese Garden, Tom McCall Waterfront Park. It's really hard, frankly, it's hard to imagine Portland without these projects. And currently under construction close by here are two projects of nearly $200 million each in which PDC played its customary spark plug role, Brewery, brewery Blocks and Museum Place. But PDC needs to complete uh, work on our current blockbuster group of projects. I say current advisedly because some of these projects have ambitions dating back decades. Such projects include, one, the construction of the North Macadam neighborhood starting with the expansion of OHSU. Two, the construction of a headquarters hotel uh, for the convention center expansion. Three, the saving of the Meyer Frank building. Four, the construction of a commercial neighborhood on the Cascade Station property on the light rail line near the airport. Five, a resolution of the competing ambitions for an area we call the Crossroads District uh, at the intersection of light rail and the streetcar. And six, construction of a three-block three project on Martin Luther King Boulevard called Vanport Square that can provide a, a, a mixed-use sustainable prototype for that area. These are just six projects, and please bear in mind that our project list is currently 400 strong. But the city needs, us to, com needs to push us, frankly, to complete these block blockbusters soon. And I can tell you from my own 30-year career that each of these projects is both stunningly difficult and inherently controversial, if, if only because of scale and visibility. But that's our job and the city needs these projects more than at any time in my memory. I guess the real conclusion of the strategy is that there's no silver bullet. There isn't a consultant that the city can hire that will prescribe a simple solution for the reason that we can't accurately predict the future. It's hard enough to figure out what's happening currently, uh, to be truthful. 
Who could have predicted that a small investment by a company called Intel in the mid-1970s would blossom in just 30 years to be Oregon's largest private employer? But to quote Fred Hansen, uh, while there's no silver bullet, there is silver buckshot. <laughs> there are lots of ideas and projects which, taken together, can make a huge difference here. That's why the mayor convened such a large group of folks to help her. And that, I think, in turn, points to a real strength of Portland and a reason for real optimism. And that is the long-standing mutual respect between the public and the private sectors here. Acting together, we, we can make a difference, and we must. Thank you. Thank you, John. In conjunction with the perfect storm, as you so aptly described it, the PDC was also hit by the Shiloh Inn lawsuit, which attacked the tax system that had been used to fund the PDC urban renewal projects, which also, as you accurately described, have become defining points of Portland. How do you propose that the tax system be revamped so that we can continue to fund these important projects? And do you see your proposed business tax alternative as part of that revamping? Heather refused to tell me what her question was in advance. Um, but I think there's, there's two aspects of this. Shiloh indecision was massive and unclear. It's less massive and more clear now. Um, the tax court has, has circumscribed what the outcome can be. At the beginning of that, we, we, needed, to, we needed to assume the worst. And it really meant shutting down uh, the majority of our projects. But tax court rulings since that time have narrowed the scope of that, and uh, we've been able to proceed. Um, but the, se the second topic, the business taxes, uh, is a very difficult one. But uh, I'm thrilled to see progress on that front. And I frankly never thought it would happen. Uh, when we called for the elimination of the business income tax, um, it seemed like a pipe dream. Now, bear in mind, you need the, the revenue is $80 million, majority for the city, but uh, I think it's split 50-30, city and county. That revenue needs to be replaced with other taxes from business. But as I mentioned in my remarks, the worst thing you can do is a business income tax because you can move to avoid it. The, the, uh, there have been a lot of solutions have been proposed, um, but most importantly, um, the county and the city have said, yes, we are prepared to uh, eliminate the tax. But they, they did say to the business community, come to us with a proposal. Hi, John. Chris Smith, club member. Uh, I want to focus on your remarks about the UGB. And if I understood you correctly, you were calling, I think, for a wider expansion uh, of the UGB. And my question is, how do you balance that against the quality of life issues? And as we look to Metro, which is going to finalize the UGB decision within the next couple of weeks, is the course they're on now the correct one as you see it? Well, it's a larger question than I can probably answer, Chris. I mean, we, we were dealing with industrial land expansion only. And um, I think a lot of people assumed that there, for example, wouldn't be expansion in Washington County, which is where there is demand in large tracts, bear in mind, uh, for industrial expansion. And uh, the recommendation that came out is that there should be, I think, about a 200-acre expansion of industrial land, which is farmland in Washington County. Um, but I think the most important thing is the quid pro quo. Um, and, I, and there's buy-in on that. And that, was, that really was a watershed event. When people would accept that if you expand the urban growth boundary for industrial land, it remains industrial land. It doesn't become a Walmart. It doesn't become a housing subdivision. And it doesn't get subdivided into smaller tracts of industrial land. So. These are all familiar faces. <laughs> Andrew Wheeler, John. I'm uh, asking this question because you're an urban planner, I think, and a, and a good one in your head, uh, and in fact, with your good building. Um, 
it has to do with the Willamette River and the East Bank Freeway. Um, <clears throat> I wish it was somewhere on the list to replace the East Bank Freeway. I don't think that great cities uh, have freeways on their banks, and I think it can make a whale of a difference to the economy of Portland if there were housing and businesses that belong to the river on the east side. Well, I, I would agree with you, and um, there's reason for optimism. Um, my, the, the, the Henry, Henry Hewitt, who uh, up until recently chaired the Transportation, Oregon Transportation Commission that I was on, chaired a group uh, that looked, this is a longer answer, Andy, but chaired a group that looked at what was called the I-5, the Columbia Crossing, which is the area between the Fremont Bridge and, and, and Vancouver, at how that particular part of the I-5 system uh, should be dealt with. Uh, Mayor Katz served on that committee, and they came up with a result that I think is generally endorsed. Uh, and, and actually, it, it produced some really interesting conclusions as well. But the next task is Fremont Bridge South. Um, and everybody knows that there are very, very difficult issues, but I think the region is prepared to start to answer that question. Paul Meyer, member of the club. Um, in retrospect, what could and should have been done to keep Columbia Sportswear in the city of Portland, and what lessons can we learn as to how to prevent that from happening in the future? <laughs> uh, I tell you. Well, I, it, uh, <laughs> No, I've, and I've talked to a lot of people who were involved in that, and, and there's, there's no simple answer, really. I think Columbia Sportswear was looking at a lot of different sites, and uh, I guess if there's a lesson, we need an early warning system. Uh, it, uh, things happen very, very quickly. Uh, it was not a, not a uh, I mean, this, this was, it was sort of happened in days rather than months, and uh, if, if I had to, if I had to list a silver bullet, if you will, for that, it would be uh, that, we, that we have a system, probably in PDC, that keeps very, very close track of those things and alerts people in a much quicker time frame to the need for action. Another familiar face. Steve Novick, City Club member. John, you occupy, I think, a unique position in Oregon public life. You're a developer with strong ties to the environmental community. You're a successful businessman, and you're the first person that progressives call when we need somebody to come out against <laughs> Sizemore's tax cuts for the rich, or when we need somebody to come out against the federal effort to repeal the estate tax. So I'm going to embarrass you. We're going we're gonna to need a new governor in 2010. <laughs> Can you promise us that you won't make any plans for that year without checking for us first? With us first? <laughs> My wife was raising uh, her hands. Actually, uh, I, I appreciate that no end. The, uh, there's a lot of people whose career I really... Uh, emulate. Bill Roberts was uh, a, a developer, if you will, who gave us some wonderful, wonderful buildings, and yet was also uh, chair of PDC uh, and got a lot of stuff done when he was chair. And he was chair of TriMet, uh, and certainly John Gray is a, a developer, if you will, who uh, has done some wonderful things for the state. <laughs> I'm Susan Pierce, member. I'm also chair of Hosford Abernathy Neighborhood, which is a southeast neighborhood <coughs> that overlaps the central east side industrial district at the south end. Looking more at your some of the previous questions about industrial lands as well as the freeway, mm -hmm. I'm interested in knowing what thoughts and visions you have for the central east side industrial district, where that fits in that 400. And what uh, would your approach to plans be? And, and part of what I want to hear is in that answer is uh, working with the Hosford Abernathy neighborhood, the Buckman neighborhood, oh, Kearns wow. neighborhood, and the Central East Side Industrial Council. <laughs> how, how many minutes do I have for that? Um, um, the rest of the day. <laughs> well, actually, I was on the losing side of the debate about the uh, Martin Luther King uh, the way, the way that will be reconstructed, the, the uh, viaduct. Um, Central East Side, I think, is not 
an area where PDC has succeeded well. We've really, our efforts have been largely to assemble land, and it's been very difficult to see that land build on. Now, this doesn't directly address your neighborhood. We own the land at the east end of the Burnside Bridge, and uh, it's, it's enough land to do something significant, but I don't think we figured out what the logical use is for that property. It could be a um, very important gateway to the central east side. Uh, we've acquired uh, what's called the ODOT, part of the ODOT properties adjacent to the freeway uh, that include the, the Holman building that I think will provide a light, uh, a light watercraft center. There are two other blocks that we would like to acquire, but uh, that is, uh, is something we talk about frequently. Uh, finding a vision for the central east side, because I don't, I don't think we have done what we should have uh, for that district. Thank you. I said you have to urge us to do, do, work harder, so that's, uh, that's, that's clearly an area. <laughs> Hi, I'm Elaine Wells with Ride Connection, a um, small private nonprofit organization and a member of City Club. You mentioned the Vanport project. Um, I understand that this may include the, mo the moving of the Multicultural Center. And I was wondering what you see as the opportunity to place that within a, um, near the light rail or near public transportation in order to serve the community that uses that center. Well, I'm sorry to say I'm not familiar with that. Don Maziotti may know more about it than I, but uh, sorry, I can't okay. tell you. Okay. Urban Mandel, City Club member. And uh, as a downtown resident, I have some unvested but strong interests in some of the projects you mentioned. The first I, I haven't heard of is what you described as the Crossroads project. That is 10th and 11th. Morrison and Yamhill crossing the light rail. What sort of plans would you have for that area, which obviously is in badly in need of some sort of development other than a max turnaround? Well, uh, we invented a new term to expand on what had been the term, the Midtown Blocks, out of a recognition that it's really more than just the potential expansion of the park blocks. And it's a difficult area uh, for us to play in because there's not just one 800-pound gorilla, there's half a dozen of them. Mm -hmm. And um, in up to now, we have been relatively, uh, uh, we've been observers, really, uh, of the process. And I think we made the decision about a month ago that, that this is the point in time when PDC needs to put a stake in the ground and say, this, this is the vision that we see uh, for that area, but do uh, you have anything specific for that uh, max turnaround mess that exists now? Uh, I don't want to. I don't want to rob the surprise. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I hope it's going to be a pleasant surprise. Well, I, I hope so too. <laughs> Guinevere Milius, City Club member. Whether we like it or not, uh, the fate of Portland and uh, the money that we bring in is tied to the state and its legislature. Um, it's obviously been a very interesting election, and um, we're facing a split in the Senate. I guess I wanted to know if there were one thing that the legislature could do to help the Portland Development Commission fulfill its mission, what would it be, and what are the chances of it happening this time around? Well, I'm, I'm reminded of the old saying that just because you're paranoid doesn't mean you don't have real enemies. Uh, and this, so this is a, a defensive reaction to that question. Uh, the best thing that the legislature could do is not uh, do away with tax increment financing for the state. Uh, Ray Polanyi, a city club member. John, how are you? I'm delighted to see you here. Uh, you mentioned a lot of projects, and I think there's one project that I haven't heard, which has to do with the central city, both east and west, and which has to do with the region. And that is the contribution that regional passenger rail, uh, max if you will, can give to the future of this area. I think we're at the point where the east-west line is a tremendous success. 
It's at four minutes interval. Uh, it may end up at three, but beyond that, I, it, it's impossible. And uh, arranging signals would only impact the cross streets and the automobile traffic and everything else. It seems to me that one of the absolute missing ingredients in this is a long-term plan to underground max east and west and under the river so we can get the capacity and the speed to serve the growth of this region, including the central city, of course, and the region itself. Uh, I think we need to do that. We need to start that now before we embark, let's say, on the transit mall, for instance, with $300 million or what, only to find out that in a couple of years it will be obsolete and won't do it, Joe. Would you comment, please? Uh, I'm disappointed about what you didn't ask, the freight rail system and so on. But uh, <laughs> Well, I, I mean, I agree with you, and I, but I think there's a lot of work happening that's outside this strategy. Uh, that's important to that. The, the strategy recommended that the city uh, work on implementing the retail strategy the PDC put forth a year ago. And that part of that was redoing the transit mall. And I think there's a lot of feeling that the work of redoing the transit mall ought to prepare for the fact that in 20 years or 30 years that will actually be underground so that the improvements that we make on the transit mall in the near, near term uh, can accommodate that. Hi, I'm Don Wagoner, member of the uh, club. And uh, I think it was just a couple of years ago that there was a uh, study finished uh, regarding the capping of uh, I-405. Uh, and it was uh, fairly warmly uh, received by at least the Oregonians editorial, and that's kind of the last we've heard of it. And my question is, is in your 400 projects, or somewhere burrowed in, the, in a corner someplace, uh, is that on the list? Uh, should there be um, uh, support from uh, various developers? And uh, just is, is that part of your uh, view? Well, our, the PDC's role is fairly circumscribed. We operate with tax increment financing in, in only 10 areas of the city that the city council decrees uh, areas that are blighted. And our role is to increase the property values uh, in that area by public investing. And that particular area is not in a tax increment financing. So there's really no ready source of money for that. Well, I don't often get two swings at the ball, but the line's short, so. Uh, one of the hats I wear is as a board member of the Northwest District Association, the Neighborhood Association of Northwest Portland. And our neighborhood, along with the Pearl and Nina, the Northwest Industrial Neighborhood, uh, all opposed the T1 development. Uh, not so much because it was bad, as because it was so much less than it could have been. Uh, and Randy Gregg wrote an interesting story about that a few weeks ago in the Oregonian. Um, can you comment on how we missed the opportunity there and what we might do in the future to avoid that? Well, I'm happy to say it didn't occur on my watch, but it, that's, <laughs> that's, not, that's not probably the answer you wanted. I think, uh, I think all of us recognize that that's a missed opportunity. Uh, and, and I agree with the comments that Randy made that uh, PDC probably could have stepped up uh, earlier. I think a lot of mistakes were made. Actually, I think that there's been some discussion about the fact that that's not irreversible. Um, Kurt, Another friendly friend. face. Hello, John. Kurt, Kurt actually was responsible for Mary and me becoming engaged, if you will. It was the end of a long trip <laughs> in the Himalayas. So, Was that what you were going to ask about, Kurt? <laughs> How's it going? <laughs> How much, how much time do I have? No. <laughs> well, let me, let's see. Can I top that? Um, <laughs> let me see. In your strategic plan, you accurately, I think, point out that taxes as well as quality of life and services are parts of the equation dealing with economic development. Our state's in a very difficult place now. We've got a ballot measure coming up January 28th. It likely will fail. And um, there are not very many Plan Bs around. And we're, uh, what we hear is a lot of service cuts coming. I want to ask you a process question. How, from your vantage point of, of the work you've done in the state, what kind of a process do we need to 
come to grips with this issue of how we finance uh, public services in the state? Well, I'll give you a cynical answer, if you will. I, I really think, uh, and, and there are a lot of parallels to the city, uh, major change doesn't happen when it ought to, when, when good-thinking people like the city club members arrive at a conclusion. They happen in a crisis, and that's, that's when fundamental change occurs. Um, and I think the reason that this strategy is so successful is that we are clearly in a crisis. I mean, the, the, this morning's paper said that we're, we're back again to 50th in unemployment and uh, as a state. Uh, there's just no question that the state is in a crisis uh, with five special sessions um, and in, ma in many cases deferring the difficulties to the next legislative session. I mean, the next legislative session is going to be something where they need to they need to charge admission to it. But I I just I just uh, I just think that that sort of a crisis coming up in the next legislative session may offer a real opportunity to take a look at some really fundamental change. So that's a cynical view of optimism, I guess, Kurt. <laughs> Ned, look. Uh, City Club member. John, we seem to be skirting the subject of how we pay for all of this. And I've long wondered why we haven't had a committee. We had a committee here in the club who studied it and then kind of buried the recommendation that maybe we should be looking at a sales tax. I don't think we can have a sales tax without taking a long look and balancing all the sources of revenue we have to run our city. We know the cost of the major products for which the city is responsible. We also know that if we put in another column, a review of those costs, so it can have credibility with the figures we come up with, that we should be looking at all the sources of the taxes that we have and the amount of money it brings in. And add to that a sales tax comparable to in the region, be it in Washington or California, the amount of money that could be raised from that. And then look at the total of all the sources where we're getting money and rebalancing it so that there's some equity if you're going to eliminate the business income tax, you're going to have to find and tax something else. And I don't think you're going to be able to eliminate one tax without having a sales tax. And I don't think you're going to be able to ever pass a sales tax unless you, there's some carrots out there that other taxes are going to be, to a certain extent, proportionally reduced. And I haven't seen anybody to take that approach, and I wish you would comment on it. Well, the city, the, the, the city county business income tax is a much, much simpler system in that the city and county have said, fine, business community, tell us how you, how, if you don't like the in income tax, tell us how you would raise the $80 million. Uh, but discussions are actually advancing on that. Uh, the list includes, uh, Again, this is a, this is a, a business tax. Um, oh, the, the, uh, the real estate transfer tax, and, and actually Washington County has one uh, that generates. This is on businesses only. Uh, people have talked about an impervious surface tax, and people say, "What's that? That's that's the reason you're spending a billion dollars on the combined sewer overfall overflow. This is a tax on asphalt roofs, asphalt lots, and so on." Uh, and even a payroll tax, so that's relatively circumscribed because it's not a, it's not an increase uh, of revenue, nor is it a de decrease of revenue to the city and the county. Um, but I think your point's very well taken, and, and you know we all felt that there was an elephant in the room in this strategy, and that was the educational system. It is, and I, and I, I mean my 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 fellow members of the strategy committee felt the education system is a very, very important, if not the most important component of economic development. Not necessarily in the short term, but certainly in the long term. And it's not something, given Measure 5, it's not something that the city of Portland can deal with on its own very effectively. 
But without that being solved, I really think that we're hamstrung. Hi, I'm Tina Mosca. I'm a city club member, and uh, I do some consulting in urban renewal. So I was actually wondering, I, th I thought it might be good for um, the rest of the audience to know what kind of efforts is Portland and PDC making <clears throat> to work with jurisdictions outside of the Portland metro area. There are a lot of urban renewals throughout or urban renewal areas throughout Oregon. What um, c collaboration and outreach efforts have been made to ensure the future um, availability of urban renewal as an economic development tool in the state? And what's not being done, do you think? Well, I'm afraid I can't answer that. I mean, uh, again, I, I suspect Don Maziotti could answer it better than I. So I Cornbroat City Club member. Uh, when Measure 5 came in, the be big beneficiaries of, member of Measure 5 were the owners of large properties, skyscrapers, this kind of thing, shifted the burden of the property tax to the individual property owners. I, I, am, I find this uh, sales tax, which is a regressive tax on the top of that shift to be just placing the, ma the majority of the tax on the people that can at least afford it. However, I know there is some talk about attempting a split role, but uh, balancing it so that small property owners, business owners would not be affected particularly, and it would only be the very large ones. The other thing that I have, I had looked at, but my income is fairly high, and I had contacted Randall Edwards about taking people with an adjusted gross federal of 75,000 amounts to 59,600 on the state side, and a 1% increase in tax just in that bracket. And uh, it would then dedicated for, uh, school, for education. And it would only affect 29% of the population. How do you feel about those types of things? Well, I'm afraid you're asking me that as an individual, not as, a, not as chair of PDC or, or having to do with the economic development strategy. Um, and I, and I, I'm afraid I can't comment, but I would recommend everybody read the Paul Krugman column in this morning's New York Times dealing with, with the inequities, increasing gap between the very wealthy and the poor. Well, to get away from all the, uh, this is Nikki Lynch, City Club member, to get away from all the dismal talk of money <laughs> and sort of get back to uh, what I think are the sort of really exciting aspects of, of you know, the PDC, and that is what, what do you think are the, the sort of things like Pioneer Square that have changed the city and the personality of the city? What would you say are the top one or two really exciting things that you're looking at that could, we could look back and say, we did this in 2002? Oh, that's a softball. Thank you. I, I think both of the $200 million projects that I mentioned that are underway are examples of that. The brewery blocks, uh, yeah, I just shake my head at the ambitions uh, of, of that project. It's just a remarkable success. And, and uh, it, it's just, it, it, but Museum Place, which is the, uh, what people call the Psycho Safeway, it's just the <laughs> movement of that across the street. Um, and I've been there. I've, you know. uh, it uh, and it, that that goes across the street, and then a wonderful uh, expansion and renovation of the YWCA, affordable housing, uh, and, and a new condominium tower, all on that same block, uh, the super block. I mean, they're, they're really dramatic. But um, the projects that I mentioned uh, that have been around for so long, I mean, it's measured in decades that, that haven't been done, I think would be equally profound. The Convention Center Hotel, we're, we're expanding the Convention Center. It's about to open. It really needs, uh, it just, it needs a headquarters hotel to succeed, and, and POVA is just desperate to see that happen. The com expansion of the hotel provides the impetus for that. PDC has 
the land needed to accommodate that, but it's a very controversial project. And the controversy comes from the effect on the existing hotel owners. And uh, it's not, it's, it, and it, and it's, a, it's probably a $250 million project. The, the issue is what size, but it's, a, and it's how you develop it, either privately or public-private. It's difficult. Um, the Meyer Frank building, as a building, is a, is a spectacular landmark. I mean, it's white terracotta. It's an absolutely gorgeous building. And it has always been ground zero. I mean, actually, the FAR of the city was based on the Meyer Frank building, 15 to 1. And um, it needs to be saved. But the bill, for example, for seismic, where the value of the building isn't increased at all, is $22 million. Now, who's the beneficiary when the when the value of the building isn't increased? That, I mean, that's that. Those are the those are the kinds of difficulties we volunteers get paid the big bucks to do. So <laughs> we're reaching the end of our time, and so as a final comment, I'd like to note that I did not hear a clear or even a a negative response to Steve Novick's question about 2010. So Steve and I will be at the back door. As you leave, you can sign up for the committee that will be working on John Russell for governor in 2010. Thank you very much. City Club is adjourned. <laughs>